Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jackie DeVore, and I'm from the University of Maryland, and specifically at the START Center, which is the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses <coughs> to Terrorism, um, a mouthful. So I'll be sharing with you for the next briefly 30 minutes um, an example of our MOOC that's currently running, and um, just our experiences developing that, so far two weeks, what we've learned, et cetera. And this will be very open, of course. Um, any questions along the way that you'd like to bring up, I'm totally comfortable to answer, but I do want to give you a brief outline of what I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about START because we're unique from a traditional academic department, and I think that's directly reflected in the type of MOOC we decided to offer and to create. And then I'll tell you a bit more about the course, um, the topic, and the delivery method of that. The specific goals of the course, which I'm excited to hear the discussion we've been having this morning about what MOOCs are for. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily expecting that, and so I'm, I'm happy to hear that, and I think I'll be able to demonstrate a little bit about that in our course. And then our delivery method and the many logistical details that go into planning a MOOC and our many lessons learned in these many logistical details. And then, of course, just the future research that we're doing with this with our sample of students in our course. So this isn't too exciting of a slide, but I'm big with pictures, so I want you to have something to look at. Um, our class is um, Understanding Terrorism and the Terrorist Threat. And so to understand our course, I want to tell you a bit about START. So we're a university-based research center at the University of Maryland. Um, but in fact, we're more of an international network of scholars. So while we're headquartered at Maryland, we kind of have this network of 50-plus institutions and the researchers at these institutions. They're all working on their own specific research agenda that falls within um, our broad category of studying terrorism from the behavioral and social sciences. So we're also funded in part by the Department of Homeland Security and we're a center of excellence and we were tasked with a specific task of studying terrorism from the behavioral science perspective. Um, so that is very much not a specific task. Um, so we ha that's why we have our 50 plus institutions and the researchers that are working along with that. So we are not a traditional department, and we're interdisciplinary, and our main goal is to take this research and bring it out to the end users in a policy relevant, um, end user friendly type of way. And who we are at START really defined, um, and it directly influenced the topic and the delivery of this course. So consistent with our goal of exposing the research, we thought a MOOC would be a perfect avenue of getting this research out there in an end user friendly type of way to a very undefined and global audience. And so an intro to our course now, again, is Understanding Terrorism and the Terrorist Threat. It's a six-week course. The first two weeks are introductory in nature, kind of bringing students up to, spe up to speed with how do we define terrorism, can we define terrorism, how do we study terrorism, what are the many challenges associated with studying terrorism, how do we access data related to terrorism studies, and then we dive very quickly into advanced research in the next four weeks. We give students a survey of the different research that are going on at the centers, what we feel is the most cutting edge research and promotes um, the most opportunities for future learning. So again, this is a disclaimer. This is our first MOOC. Um, I had first heard of MOOCs in May of 2013, and then we started developing this in June of 2013. So I had a very fresh perspective on how we were doing this. Um, we did not know much about MOOCs, like I said, but what we had heard was a statistic that I think I found that is now untrue. Um, but we had heard that 1% of students completed MOOCs. Um, from now, I've heard actually anywhere from 1% to 10%. Um, but that 1% rate really kind of threw us for a loop. And we were trying to first understand what a MOOC was, and then we heard this 1% of students actually finish it. And so we kind of sat down without really doing any research and just kind of talked about, okay, what is this 1%? But more importantly, we found that we were focusing on who are those other 99%? Who are those other students that are coming to a course? What do they want? Why are they joining? Why are they registering? Um, what are they hoping to gain from that? And so we decided that we were gonna target our course towards the 99% of students who weren't completing the course. Rightfully or wrongfully, we're still not sure, and I'm sure we can discuss that later. Um, but we decided we really wanted this to be a tool of exposure. We wanted it to be a pointing mechanism to the research, a pointing mechanism to the field, um, exposing the field, and an introducing an objective, what we think is an objective study of an otherwise very emotionally and a politically charged topic. Um, we wanted to promote a desire to learn more, and we wanted to essentially 
If we summed up our goals, it would be that we wanted to make educated consumers of terrorism-related news. We just thought it was kind of our duty. We had the research. We wanted people to be able to open their front page of the newspaper and just have some context or something to provide and to better understand what they were hearing about terrorism. So what I had originally prepared was that I thought this seemed contrary to what I've heard, at least from, um, I think I can say this, from our provost and our university. It was, it was, a, it was very different. Um, it's about what you were all saying earlier, completion rates, and about the academic rigor, the assessment measures that you're using in the class. If it can be transferred to academic credit, those were the pressures that we were kind of getting on our end. And they weren't lining up at all with our goal of really exposure and promoting future learning. And so that was a struggle for us as we designed it, um, as we looked through the platform, how it was designed, what was available for us to use in terms of assessment and how we were conveying the topic. Um, but it was what worked for us. We were confident and decided to keep going towards, towards reaching those 99% of students. Um, it was definitely our first stab. We will potentially change this course drastically over the next few times that we edit it. Um, and we're kind of looking at it as a survey in itself uh, and, and using whatever we've provided this first round and then really fine tuning it to see what the students like and what they engage with towards next time. So I can have, I really have no idea what we'll be offering next time around and I wish I had our post course survey results to share with you about what the students are liking. Um, but I do have a bit of insight just from their discussion board and forum activity of what they've been feeling initially about the course. So these are our instructors. I want to talk about the delivery method. Um, you might notice one man here. <laughs> I tried to find the most flattering um, screen, screenshot as I could of each of these guys. So you can see on our screen our instructors. I thought this was important. I'm a visual person. And just to kind of really put into context how many people we really have behind this. Um, and like I said earlier, we have a large network of scholars. And it's, we wanted to utilize them in this course. So. There's a blend here between, um, or a battle, I guess, between consistency and variety. So we know that in order for it to really be a sound learning experience, there needs to be an element of consistency for students. So we have two full instructors. Uh, at the very top, you'll see Gary LaFree and Bill Braniff, our director and our executive director at the center. So they provide an intro to each week. They provide context. They provide comments throughout the week. And they provide concluding remarks. They kind of essentially bookend each of the weeks of the course. And then you'll see the variety below in the bottom 10. So these are our guest lecturers who present for about 10 to 15 minutes of what they're doing that's related to the general topic of each module. And each week has anywhere from two to four different guests, again, bookended and kind of commented throughout the week by Gary and Bill. And so an example of our video format, um, it's pretty simple. Um, really, it was just me kind of learning as we went, um, that we needed to have someone who knew how to edit videos. We didn't have that, so I went to a training to learn how to edit videos, and this is what we got. So um, they're simple. We have a video on the left-hand side at all times. There's someone you see them speaking. It's never just audio. And then you have text on the right-hand side that corresponds to it. You can see there's a traditional lecture style on the top left. He's just kind of talking at a podium, giving some more introductory remarks. And then on the bottom here, you can see Bill. He kind of has a diagram. He's walking through it with the students, kind of trying to engage them in the bottom. The reason we chose this, in all honesty, it was just recommended to us by the IT office at our university. They said that the more that you could have on the screen, students are such different learners with such a, a large audience, find some way to capture one of them. So that if somebody wants to see text, if someone wants to see video, someone wants to close their eyes or turn off their screen and just listen to audio, they can do all of that here. And Coursera is the platform that we're offering the course from. And they have a subtitle uh, capability that they um, can, students have the option to click on that and to watch subtitles throughout the course. So you kind of have, a, you do have a lot going on in these lectures, but it was kind of our way to test it, put it all there, see what students like, and bring it back. So um, we're not sure if we'll continue this. Some students on the form have said they're totally overwhelmed and distracted. There's too many things going on. Other students say there's not enough, and they've asked continually every week, well, can I have a, a script? Can I now have that script in an outline format? Can I have the script in just a bullet? Can I have it in an essay format? I gave in to all of them in the first week, and then I was like, what am I doing? So um, the students have a lot to do. Um, they have a lot of access to see these materials in different ways. Um, 
Okay, so personally, um, I wanted to just kind of put in a remark in here about why we, we've made it in so many different accessible and different media forms for the students is that when we originally sat down and talked about this course, and I think it, it may be specific to our topic of terrorism, we really wanted students in areas of the world who are specifically impacted by terrorism, may not have access to education about terrorism. We really wanted them to be able to access this. And so I had a student in the discussion forum that um, he wrote on maybe the third or fourth day of the course. He drives to an internet cafe in Uganda and he sits there for seven hours as he downloads all of the week's lectures. They're not seven hours long, they're about maybe 50 minutes total for all we have about eight mini lectures. He downloads them for seven hours and he drives eight hours back and then he plays them for his town. Um, and that, I made that one comment and it was totally worth it, the entire class. Um, and there are so many students who then posted underneath that form. That's why I'm here too. An attack had happened two days ago. I want to know how to stop this. I mean, they're big goals, they're big ideas, but to see these students that have them, is, it's really uh, awesome is the best word that I can kind of think of as the students are in there. So that's kind of why we've been, or why I've been open to providing these scripts and PDFs and to providing these subtitles in as many languages as we can, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about your goals for designing the course, I think that directly correlates to how many options and how much time you put into all of these different ways for students to access them. We also have PDFs if they just want to download the slide, et cetera. I could go on about this for a while. But before I go any further about the logistical details, I do want to show you our course. So I'm going to pull that up on here. If that's OK, I probably should have logged in earlier. If you just give me one second to pull this up. This is OK that I'm doing this right. I didn't know if this was password protected. Oh no. <laughs> that was just an example of the technical difficulties you think on the ground. Not responding. What about the Apple app? The Apple <laughs> app. There's a Coursera app where many of our students actually access the course, which is really interesting. Um, okay, well, while I'm waiting for him to. You might want to try that in the forum also. Okay. We get the basic or the advanced internet package here. <laughs> oh, I got to log out of your account. Oh, by the way, yeah, if you just noticed, I took a Coursera link. <laughs> So here is our course. Oh wow, this is pretty big. Okay, so there are six modules in our course. This is the home screen on Coursera. I'm not sure if anyone's taken a Coursera course before, but this is what students see when they log in. So you'll see the announcements in the center, and this is how instructors engage with the students throughout the week. They post an uh, announcement that kind of engages with what they're seeing on the discussion forum and what just overall summary points that they've said. Um, I'm trying to point, so you can see here, maybe you can't see, in the first paragraph, Gary points out and he says, Jack Howard also raises an interesting hypothesis as to why burstiness might vary from country to country. Jack Howard is a student on the discussion forums, and so we just um, engage with the students, we pick out students who have made interesting remarks throughout the course, and the professors use these as they interact with them. And so you'll see we have plenty of of announcements that are here, we give them access to different links, to different articles that we've posted that directly relate to the course. But so there's six modules, there's time released. You can see week one and week two are highlighted because we're in the middle of week two here on Monday or Sunday at midnight, week three will become available for the students. And when you click on each week, um, we've done this in a modular format so that each week is all inclusive. 
So for week one, they have an introduction. It's a brief written text just summing up what they're going to be talking about before. And then there's learning objectives, three very brief and explicit and very simple, might I add, learning objectives for this kind of introductory exposure type week. Then there's our video lectures here. They can click on these. It opens a new tab and it will show them the lectures. There is readings for students, which links them there, discussion questions, and a quiz. So everything they need is in their one week of the course. And so we've designed it that way because we felt that that was probably the easiest way for them to manage the course content. Sure. Those are minute lengths, yes. That was actually a request from a student specifically. Um, Yes, there are some very long lectures. It is recommended that, they say that students lose their attention after five minutes, is what I was told at the most. Um, working with guest lecturers on our first time, um, I did a, a, my best to edit these down for content, um, but some pr people provided um, a 45 minute video that I had to then cut down to, to 25, et cetera. But um, on average, they are about 12, I would say, is our average time. So I put them there. And then you can also see students requested to have a formatted script downloaded. And so. One of the best features of Coursera has is the speed up button. Yes. So these lectures and oh, I can't see it. Yeah, that, that may be what. That might be what I need this morning is a slow down button. Um, so anyway, this is kind of what the course looks like. So I'm going to go into the logistical details now that we thought about while we were planning this. Um, so lessons learned will be intertwined throughout this as I go through. Um, oversight and expectations was the first thing. So there are many levels of oversight and expectations that I had absolutely no idea that existed. Um, so we started planning for this course in June, and we signed the contract with Coursera in the end of November. So we actually didn't even realize what was expected to communicate with Coursera when they needed to review what type of assessment measures they required us to have until we were five months into presenting the video. And so that's really important to establish up front. What expectations and oversight level does your department have over you? Does your university have in regards to the academic rigor of your course? Because that's a challenge. Our provost and our university is involved with these courses we provide. And they do want to review the course, and they see the content that's available. Um, and in some cases, it's had to be justified as to why it isn't equivalent to a three-credit college course. And so having those expectations very clear from the beginning is very important. And to understand who it is that's going to be reviewing your course before it goes live. We didn't realize it was actually going to be reviewed at any level. And so our university reviewed it, our Coursera team reviewed it, and then um, our Coursera team at the University of Maryland, the University of Maryland, and then Coursera also reviewed our course. And so that was important from the get-go that we understand that. And so let me read you, I brought this contract here. I want us to read one paragraph from our contract, just so you can have an idea of putting into some context of what we were expected to provide. And this is from Coursera. I think they're the largest um, platform that delivers MOOCs right now. So we were told that A, the course must be a rigorously designed course that meets high academic standards, that uses multimedia content in a coherent, high production value presentation not just a simple lecture capture, <laughs> to provide the end user opportunities for a rich set of interactions and assessments, whether provided by automatic grading technology or peer-to-peer -peer interaction activities, resulting to a meaningful learning experience that significantly transcends static content or plain videos. So that was our content. We got that in November, and then we started to panic. Um, but no, that was, I mean, that's a reasonable expectation, but it's something that should be very clearly understood from the beginning. And so understanding if there are any contracts at any level that you need to adhere to, of course, um, you probably are all like, yeah, duh, um, I should have known that. But, but yeah, that was something we didn't understand. So next, moving into the subject matter, the length, and the instructors of your course. I think the key here when we think about this is flexibility. When we sat at our round table thinking about the course we wanted to design, we thought about the subject matter, we thought about the exact instructor that was going to teach it, and we thought about our exact audience of students that were going to be there. Our biggest mistake was thinking that we knew the exact audience of students that were going to be there. 
And so sometimes the subject material just doesn't fit with this, this type of audience, this type of technology platform, um, and either in a length of the course. And so being flexible on all three of those aspects is very important. So exploring the platform in advance is something that by taking MOOCs is very important to do. Take as many of them as you can. And just by taking them, I mean signing up and exposing yourself to them, just understanding what the platform can do. Because there are a lot of things out there. I maybe know 20% of what Coursera platform can do in terms of these peer activities and interactions that students can have, these interactive blogs and wikis that students are all contributing to make one cohesive document. Um, we don't have one of those in our course, but I'm currently enrolled in probably 12 other MOOCs right now, and I'm consistently learning all of these different opportunities. So really taking as much time as you can beforehand to understand what they can do. And my suggestion is to pick one platform and just learn that platform. Just sign up for as many courses as you can within one, one host so that you can really get to know that one well. Um, and then the length of four to six weeks. So Four to six weeks is what we were told was the optimal time to hold a MOOC, which seemed extremely short for what we were thinking. We had started off with a 12-week plan because um, we kind of thought it was going to be the same as an academic semester, and that was not the case. Uh, most students, again, this was encouraged us about completion rates. So students barely complete the courses to begin with, and for the ones that do complete the course, it's usually in four to six weeks. And so that's kind of where we, we took it back to four to six weeks to see where that started with. And so it depends on what your goals are again. Do you want it to be something where students complete it, make it in four to six weeks? Going back, we might have spread this back out over 12 weeks knowing that to begin with only, I say 1%, but again, know that I have no idea where that came from. 1% of students are gonna complete it. Maybe we would have spread it out over time and really made it exactly what we wanted to expose students to and not rushing it due to these external pressures of completing the course. And so the audience, again, that's what I said that was an important part. So when we sat around and talked about it, we wanted to, like I said, make educated consumers of terrorism-related news. And we thought specifically about Practitioners in the federal government, that was our first stab at it. Law, local law enforcement, state law enforcement agencies, Joint Terrorism Task Force members, the intelligence community, DHS. And our first stab at creating the course was entirely for them. That is a mistake in a MOOC. You cannot expect, no matter who you think your students are going to be, you will never know. And I think even the more you plan to try to cater the class towards a specific subset of students, it's going to be even more diverse than you were expecting. And I think one of the biggest issues with doing so is it creates these in-groups and out-groups in your learning, in your community learning environment. When you're constantly making references to, well, I know that you're a practitioner and you work in the intelligence community. Well, you don't. Maybe actually only 5% of your students work in the intelligence community. Then you start to see these sub-threads form on the discussion forum that say, oh, well, I guess this doesn't really apply to me. I guess I don't really understand because I haven't worked there before. And you can kind of see the people that are located in countries that are dealing with terrorism-related issues in their backyard, interacting with these students, and there's become these clear kind of divide between them, and that's something you don't want to do, and we've readjusted our lectures to kind of make it a more inclusive, a more global type of learning environment for them. So in-groups and out-groups form very quickly on the discussion forum. Students are looking for something to identify with each other for, and if you're doing something to promote that in a bad way, it just um, exacerbates that issue. So that's something important. And so making this as global as you can and thinking about your topic and does this topic transcend cultures? Does it transcend the experience? Does it transcend age? We have 10-year-olds in our class. You are not supposed to have a 10-year-old in our class. They sign an agreement that say they need to be at least 13 years old um, with parental consent. And so that's kind of an issue for us as we have IRB approval to study the discussion forums here and um, students that are openly saying that they're minors and that they didn't uh, agree to the consent is kind of bringing everything back into question. But we have 10-year-olds with um, retired military veterans that are 76 years old sitting, uh, engaging with each other in a discussion forum. Okay. Another note that I made here, these are kind of, I prepared a lot of things, so I apologize. There's just like a running stream of conscious as I walked through the production of the MOOC here. So I made a note here to be explicit about your perspective in the course description. So we got 
uh, quite a few students in the first week that said, you never told us this was from a US perspective. Were we supposed to assume that because you're in the United States that this is from a US perspective? We actually thought this was one of the most objective courses we had put forward, that our examples were not US-centric, they were global examples. It just goes to show you that it's, it is always more that you can do to culturally expand the topic that you're teaching. And even if you think that you're touching on it from a very international perspective, um, most likely you won't be. And so we're learning so much from our students as to, to where they're coming from and to, and you don't know what the geographic breakup of your students is either until the class starts. Um, we had one retweet from, I think it was Africa Live. I think that was the name of the Twitter handle. They have um, 18,000 followers and they retweeted it and the next day we saw a jump in 3,000 students. So just depending on who kind of grabs you on social media, how it gets marketed by chance. Um, some of it can be purposeful, but there's an element of it that you can never control. You really have no idea who's gonna be sitting in your course. So the delivery method that we chose specifically, I'll go into that next. These were the videos, essentially. So when we thought about MOOCs, granted we had not really known much about MOOCs, but every MOOC I registered for had a video. They were almost 100% about videos. It was a series of six, seven videos each week. Most of them were about five minutes. And so that was our first instinct. We figured we needed to have videos and we needed to use those. Going back, um, I think we would do this a little bit differently. We, we looked for variety, and we did that with our guest lecturers. However, I'd really like to see a combination of lecture style, a combination of a teacher teaching in front of students in a classroom, question and answer sessions where an instructor is being interviewed, um, or they're interviewing a guest lecturer sitting next to them. Maybe a collaborative dialogue with two instructors sitting next to them. Um, and anything else that I haven't thought of, maybe you have more ideas for what you could do, but I think Students want variety. They've said a couple of times already now, okay, I'm kind of tired of the guy in front of the podium. Yes, he's moving his hands, and yes, he sounds friendly, but I'm tired of that. And so the most, the most you can do, I think, to kind of to get at students that way, um, I think, makes and creates a more enjoyable learning environment. And then audio, video, of course, we made the choice to just to do audio and video. Um, the video production was relatively easy to learn. Um, I did all of the video production because we realized that we did not actually have the support to, to do that. Um, so we have a Coursera team at the University of Maryland. Our provost um, created a position for someone, a short-term position for two years to lead a team of University of Maryland MOOCs. So we do have a Coursera team at the University of Maryland and we were paired up with an instructional designer who would help with any coding questions I had about coding on our course wiki pages and detailed um, technical difficulties that I had questions with. So I had that assistance, but I had to do it. So that was something that was um, unexpected, I guess. Um, and I do want to say that it was, it was easy to learn if you want to produce a simple video. If you want to do what we showed up on the screen before, which I'll go back to that now actually, if you want to do this, it's relatively easy to learn. To record a video, to put it in a slide, to have text that goes along with it. We do have some simple animations, so when a professor's talking about a graph, we do circle things, we put some arrows on it, we highlight different bar charts as it goes through, and those types of things are pretty simple to do. The only thing that it is, is time consuming, and that's just something that you can't, you physically can't make it any less time consuming because you think about the amount of time that the video is and you multiply that by I would say three. And so if you have a 30 minute video, it's gonna take you at least 90 minutes to work through it. And that's at least if you've kind of had some experience with it. And that's just something you can't, you can't, um, you can't get rid of that aspect of it. And so it needs to be high quality is what I've also realized. So we thought ours was high quality and I mentioned this earlier when we were kind of going around. Um, we thought it sounded fine. Um, apparently, the high definition video and the audio that is 100% crisp and clear is, is absolutely pertinent and is needed and is really important for students, and particularly for students where English is a second language. If there's any bit of feedback in the background of your video, a lot of their translating softwares can't pick up on what you're saying. And so even if you think you've created a, a great video, check with your platform. See if there's some type of audio system test that they can do on your video to make sure it meets the requirements that students are gonna need. Because it wasn't frustrating for me 
um, because it was going to be extra work when students pointed out that they couldn't hear, I just felt bad. I felt bad that students weren't able to use these translating softwares to get into the video. Um, and they definitely are understandable. It's basically the quality that we heard of, um, it was Jim, right? Jim's video earlier, that's about what the quality of our video, a little bit better. Um, and they were, we were told that they couldn't understand a word of what was being said. And so their bandwidth is, in some areas of the world, is 10, 100 times worse than what we have here. So you take the quality of what we have and you kind of break that down tenfold, and that's what some students are experiencing when they're watching your course. So my suggestion is to figure out with your university if there's a type of software that they at least offer support for. If your instructional team, even if they won't do it for you, is there something that if you call the IT office at your university, they'll be able to answer the most basic questions you have about it. And whatever that is, I would go with that. It's invaluable to have at least just someone you can call that can check on what you're doing. Even if another platform or another software is a little bit better in video editing, just having that fall back to somebody who can at least understand how you're backing it up and at least understand um, just the basic questions that you might have with it. Sure, yeah. Um, let me skip to then. I'm not necessarily gonna talk too much about our assessments. But I will talk about our reading materials, which was interesting for us. There were a lot of copyright issues we faced with pr putting anything inside of our course. Really, Coursera frowns on any bit of third-party content. Uh, they really don't want that in their course. And I um, want to read to you what they told us to do. They said, when considering the use of copyright materials in your MOOC, it may be helpful to think about the process of securing permissions as if you were the author of a textbook obtaining rights for materials you would like to include in your book. While this is not to rule out fair use as an option, it is to be used with care and in parallel with consultation with your university's attorneys or legal personnel. So almost all of our reading materials are from START. There are, are um, articles that we have access to that we're able to provide. And um, that creates some feedback from students too. They want a wide variety of scholarly academic literature. And when you can't necessarily give that to them, it can be a bit frustrating. And so that's something I definitely suggest from the get-go, working with a, a university legal team and figuring out what you do have access to provide to the students. Okay, and the last thing I'll tell you about is just about how we manage the discussion forums. So we have 15,000 students in our course, 7,000 students ever logged into the course, and 4,000 are active on the discussion forums. I thought this was gonna be a disaster, but it's actually not. Our students, which is a complete surprise to me, and maybe you have insights as to why this is, but our students seem to be very scholarly in their responses. They seem to be almost dispassionate. Um, even those that are experiencing it in an area of their world are very objective about it. Um, and they post probably an average of 250 words per post on the discussion forum. It isn't this quick, I agree, I don't agree. It's 250 words, 500 words, an equivalent of two pages back and forth with students. So it's a really academically challenging and rigorous environment on the forums. And I'm not sure if that's because we haven't provided, or we've kind of given them that flexibility without a lot of heavy course load materials that go along with it. We've kind of allowed for that open experience. But what we do is we have two teaching assistants and they give me this form at the end of the week and I ask them to look at overall themes and to write briefly about what they're seeing on the discussion forum. Is there a question that's receiving more traffic than others? And then on the second is popular misconceptions. So is there a popular uh, misconception that they're seeing? Are they, applying misinformation? Are they applying information in the wrong way? And then in the last is student call outs. So they directly quote students that they think have posed insightful questions or comments. So then I go through these for the two teaching assistants and kind of highlight what I think is important and then we send these on to our faculty members who then put together some announcements and some reflections based on this and they call the students out directly from what they've seen. And so I think at the end, um, I do wanna tell you what we're researching. We have three research questions that we're trying to look at with this discussion forum. I know it's a self-selected audience but it's so rare to have such a broad and diverse audience that's talking about an emotional topic in a discussion forum like this. So we'd like to say that there's something we can take from that about how society in general talks about terrorism. We'll see as the course goes on. But our three questions are, are there topics that are more or less drive student engagements? Are there topics that more or less drive emotional discussions? And are there archetypes of discussion forum participants? Kind of like a community steward that emerges over time. And so in summary, I think it takes time to do this right. 
Um, register for a lot of other courses. Don't try to do too much your first time. Do what you're comfortable with and do it well and then use that knowing that you're gonna be offering this course and it's a continual rebuilding process. Many students will register for the same course over and over again to get access to the new material that's provided each time. Understand what your teaching load is and what level of support your university or your department is gonna give you in doing this. Our faculty member says it's the equivalent of maybe teaching three full courses at the same time, so. Um, and that's without doing any of this administrative support that I'm adding here, that's really just looking at the discussion forum, preparing these comments over time. And then being flexible in your material, in your audience, in your time, in your delivery method, and um, to have, of course, thick skin like you probably all have as students kind of review on a global level when you have 10,000 students letting them know what you think about your material. And then making a checklist and delegating very early on in the process and not being afraid to have more support than necessary. So I think that would be it. Questions for Jackie? Um, um, I'll turn the mic around. Do the students have access to your library at University of Maryland? No, they do not. Yeah, just kind of a question and an observation. When you were saying that the, that, um, the students would um, write you know, substantive things and rather with a rather dispassionate look at things, um, do you think that that's because what a MOOC does provide is this kind of neutral space of anywhere? I mean, you don't necessarily even know where the, I guess, well, you probably wouldn't know where the person's, good, but you wouldn't have to even know where the person is. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can be not only anonymous, but it's almost like a kind of beyond space and time. And so they may feel they have time and they're not, you know, around people where they have to justify a statement of disagreement or they feel anxious to agree or to support or oppose. And, um, and I just think that's something that maybe we should stress more about MOOCs, that they provide that kind of space. Mm -hmm. And in terms of this maybe somewhat uh, anonymous option, when you were saying that some minors, like 10-year-olds, Ron, how do you screen to know that, peop that people actually do get parental consent if they're 13 to 18 or you can't, or you can't. just, so you just go with it? We so put in our, our IRB that this is what students agree to and that we, we don't have any checks and balances over that. Been busy. But yeah, I think Coursera in particular has done a really good job at promoting that type of learning environment. And I think students are all very aware of that when they sign up for the MOOC. They know that this is the environment they're entering into. And then we had to learn from them that this is what we were entering into. So. Yeah, I have a question. You mentioned you have 4,000 active participants. How do you process all this information? It's funny. Our teaching assistants are so used to the world of social media, of quickly rolling through a Facebook feed, quickly reading through Twitter. Um, they are handling it and they see that they feel that they see most of them. It sounds like it's, un, it's impossible to do, but surprisingly when you get into the discussion forum, it's sorted by the top threads and the most viewed and you can kind of roll through and kind of glaze through them. It's pretty easy to pick out the kind of keywords that students are using. Um, students upvote and downvote each other's posts. So you can kind of highlight yourself to the most popular posts that are out there. But the only thing I can really say is that I think our minds just make us think it's gonna be a lot worse than it is, but in reality, it's the equivalent of probably reading one big article um, that is probably what you'd read per day of what you're seeing on the discussion forums. Um, so, you no, you, you're fine. Um, I think, I mean, I'm quite happy to have people continue the, the discussion. Um, if other people want to get out, grab some coffee, use the bathroom, whatever, um, we'll kind of reconvene the, the formal part of the program, which will be David, let's say at 1025, and you'll have a full half hour as, you know, in, this, as in the schedule. Um, but if people want to get up, even just stretch their legs, go ahead. Okay, I just had a, a question. You began by saying this, that your audience, you were targeting it at the 99% who didn't complete it. And it's, it sounded kind of like neat, it's like Brian, o, Brian Eno writing music for yeah. here in elevators, you know. <laughs> uh, but as you went on, you seemed to be talking about this community of 4,000 that are more or less with you. So did you, did you drop that as an objective or how did that play out? No, I think, um 
it's almost a different, we're looking at them as two separate things. I think our forum and participants that are there, we're engaging with them, but in a way, a lot of what we're talking about is unrelated to what's being presented in the course. There's a lot of tangent discussions that are happening. It's almost like it's its own just interactive discussion. We really targeted the content of the videos and the delivery method to the 99%. So it's kind of two different things for me when I think about it. Yeah. I'm going to suggest we all take a break. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Hi, Victor. Thank you.